the T5 peeps. Bob the Dragon, Data Magnet, Cat Crab Lobster, Duck Machine, Try Again 95, Astray the Dreamer, Mezik, Udic Joel, German Chemist, Casper Arnholtz, and Chaos to Must. Thank you very much. Story number one. The Humans Got FTL. Written by Mercury the Dealer. FTL is complicated. As it turns out, the universe does not enjoy having its laws broken, and so empires need to get creative when making FTL. Some, like the Borviat, decided that they would first use portals, create a stable-ish tear in space-time, and you can go to whatever portal yours is attuned to in basically an instant. It's the galactic equivalent of a bullet train. A vision gets you everywhere quickly, but it is expensive. Believe it or not, building a giant portal the size of a continent isn't easy or cheap, and that doesn't take into account how breaking it destroys the entire system's connection to the rest of the Empire, which is why only well-protected and stabilized systems get one. There are also people like the Deritos. Instead of creating a tear through which two or more points in space-time can touch, you can simply contract and expand space around you with a hyperdrive. It sounds like a perfect solution, until you realize that in order to get enough energy for the thing to work, you will need to collect and store the gigantic amount of fuel, usually in the form of hydrogen or helium. Good luck colonizing a system without at least three alpha-class gas giants in it, and by the way, activating the drive with anything in the way will be like getting shot by a class Y railgun, so you'll still be stuck at non-FTL speed while inside the system. Most empires learned and used both technologies, portals for well-established and growing colonies, and hyperdrives for military vessels, and other things that just don't require much performance. Most. There is one empire, one species to be exact, that decided that they were too good for any of that. Humans. Humans weren't very lucky. They were born in a small system with only two worthy gas giants, and even those were far from big. Normally, that would mean that they would develop portal tech and adopt hyperdrives later. But the apes were far from normal. We first met through one of their scouting vessels. The first obvious sign that something wasn't right was its size. It was too small to be carrying a common hyperdrive. In fact, the entire thing was smaller than a common hyperdrive. So, we assumed it must be a pre-FTL ship. Send the crew into the void while in cryostasis and hope you find something. Except that cryostasis ships don't teleport around in their current system, do they? Well, this one was doing just that. Speculation exploded in the scientific community. The ship wasn't pre-FTL, that was for sure. And unless it could hide a continued size megastructure that wasn't portal technology... But how could something that small fuel even a basic hyperdrive? Turns out that it couldn't. Apparently, when faced with the challenge of how to travel faster than light, humanity decided that portals were too expensive and hyperdrives were too slow. So what did they do? They created Star Core engines. The concept is simple. Well, at least as simple as something that bends all the laws of physics to the limits can be. You launch a very small anomaly which your star core engine is synced with at your target location and whatever speed you feel like using. Then the anomaly reaches the location that you activate the engines and hope to whatever you think is holy that the instant teleportation doesn't fuse you with the nearest crew member. Simple, effective, the versatility of the hyperdrive fused with the efficiency of portals. So we naturally asked how they made it. What they told us made the entire galaxy collaboratively gasp in sheer disbelief. When making these drives, there are two main problems to consider. How to fuel the engines and how to make a stable anomaly. Turns out, the humans found the answers in the exact same place. Inside living stars. The sheer density and extreme conditions of the core of a star makes physics somewhat flexible. They used that flexibility to make the anomaly generators. On the other side, stars are pretty good fuel source, especially their cores. So, if you're taking the core for the anomaly generators, might as well take some for the fuel. And that brings us to why no one could believe their respective auditory receptors when the humans started explaining how their drives worked. 
How? In the name of the void are they getting their hands on the core of stars? Autonomous drones? No, the electromagnetic fields of stars will destroy any particularly sensitive circuits. That includes most components of advanced AI. Piloted drones? No. While the electromagnetic field might not destroy them, the signal delay after entering the star would be too great for the drone to be useful. Planet crackers? No. Not only are those illegal and immoral, but they also wouldn't do much to account that the stars are, believe it or not, bigger than planets. A giant star-sized planet cracker? No. Those are myths made by humans to scare people. Uh, probably. Also, the objective is to mine the core, not destroy it. So how do they do it then? Simple. They send people. They send people. Star core samplers, men and women who risk their lives every day by entering a giant metal tube surrounded by inconceivable amounts of heat dampeners and launch themselves and the nearest star. Most of the heat is collected by the heat portals, as they call them, essentially a thin space anomaly shaped to fit around the ship and send the heat to wherever they want it to go. If you ever saw a map of human space and wondered why that one bright dot isn't marked as a star, then congratulations, you just saw one of the heat dumping grounds. Anyway, after launching into the star, the samplers just sit around waiting to get the core and hoping that the heat dampeners don't decide to break. Once they do get the core, they release the piloted drones to collect as much of the core as possible. And then they make their way back, as if they didn't just enter the most dangerous place in the galaxy. Short, only perhaps to a black hole. If you ever wonder why no one dares to touch human space or challenge them, politically or otherwise, it isn't because their drives are better than any other, or because they are the only suppliers of star core fuel in the entire galaxy. No, those things pale in comparison to the real advantage. Humans are willing to break into stars to achieve their goals. Void have mercy if they make killing their goal. End of story. Story number two. Then, what are their weapons like? Written by SlowAD2584. The alien patrol was hunkered down in a muddy ditch under the heavy fire from a jungle canopy sloping up a distant hillside. Don't worry, the humans will send fire support craft. It'll be over soon. Not only will we survive this and get lifted out, we're in for one hell of a show. You're gonna love this kid. The young warrior was nervous, it was true. He had already been shot through the shoulder, and acidic slivers burning the agony deep in his marrow. The enemy, firing at them from the cover of the jungle canopy, was cowardly, insidious, and unfortunately, very, very many in number. He heard the distant approaching whine of the air turbines, the distant sound of the human atmo craft. He spotted it, clearing a mountain ridge in the distance. Just one craft? he asked uncertainly. Yep, that's all it'll take. Oh wow, they tossed an archangel. We may need to find better cover. The white and gold craft was fast and had a distant predatory bird aspect to its design. Like a raptor in a dive, talons outstretched before it, as if moments from catching its prey. The humans had a definite artistic style when it came to military warcraft. There was no doubt that it was a thing of beauty, in a deadly sort of way. As it whisked over the distant enemy position, it blurred streak and a staccato brrrt was heard, and a cloud of glowing white. Things were ejected rapid fire from the craft's sides, arcing down to the jungle as the craft pulled up in a zoom climb, displaying a glorious enviable flight envelope as it accelerated up into the clouds. Several anti-air missiles streaked up into the clouds from different parts of the hillside in pursuit of the plane. The cloud of glowing objects fell right amid the center of the enemy position. And wow! The entire jungle ignited as if it was covered in gasoline. Those things must be uh, millions of degrees. The jungle cover basically incandesced into ash near instantly, dissolving away as the cloud of uh, whatever they were fell to the ground. When they reached the ground, the screams began to be heard. The young warrior was amazed then slightly horrified at the scene unfolding before him. 
Wow. Well, what about the missiles? Thunderclaps were heard in the clouds, with the building flashes of white light and a thump of implosion missile warheads. The warrior was concerned. Then the archangel swooped into view, training edge of its wings glowing with an ionic blue. A final missile swerved as it vectored in, and a bolt of lightning leapt from the training wings of the aircraft, vaporizing the missile as it and the archangel arced and dove back towards the jungle hillside, through the hole in the clouds that the missiles had made. The pilot has some style, the veteran warrior said admiringly. That was amazing! What incredible weaponry they had! Weaponry? What are you talking about? The attack run hasn't begun yet. The young warrior gestured in confusion at the lava fields bubbling in the distance of what used to be the enemy position. Oh, that, nah, he just popped flares, as they call it, hoping to draw out the main enemy force location on the flyby. Those were just countermeasures. Those missiles gave away the main enemy location. Now they're doomed. The young warrior looked at the now quiet hillside. No gunfire or enemy movement at all. Stunned. Countermeasures? Then, um, what are their actual weapons like? Well, uh, we may be blind for a few days after this, but, uh, we got front row seats to see. From a distant aircraft, roaring down in a power dive, talons outstretched and ascending, powerful wine, like a hydroelectric dam turbine ramping up in speed, could be heard. The End of Part 1 What Their Weapons Are Like, Part 2 the powerful building whine of the Archangel reached a deafening shriek, and the purpose of the outstretched stylistic talons of the craft became clear. One of the talon arms detached and streaked down to the hillside, glowing a blinding golden white. It was unclear if the claw was glowing due to heat, radiation, or if it was just atmospheric friction due to incredible speed that it was moving. It was practically a blur, even at this distance. The weapon streaked down into the distant hillside, leaving a glowing line in its path, and seemed to just disappear into the trees and the hill. There was no bang, no thump. The two warriors huddled in the trench stared at the sudden silence, as the archangel pulled sharply up and disappeared into the clouds. Before the young warrior could speak, the veteran elbowed him and said, Wait for it. The entire hillside, approximately a kilometer in diameter, started to swell upwards, ballooning like volcanic bubbles, trees, rocks, and bedrock revealed concrete bunkers, trucks, soldiers, tanks. Everything was uplifted in an odd anti-gravity hover, seemingly gently being lifted up and spread apart. Maybe it was the distance and the scale of it had just made it seem like slow motion and gentle. As the deep underground layer started to crumble and separate, the gap revealed a spiraling swirl of golden white light deep in the center of it all. And suddenly, all of it was enveloped in a blinding glow. It was beautiful, honestly. So blinding, but so impossible to look away. As a starburst of light flared to a painful peak, it suddenly faded and winked off. What was left at the impact site was a smooth spherical crater, one kilometer wide, its edges glossy smooth. Everything within what was floating above was just gone. The veteran warrior shook himself from his days and grabbed the younger warrior. Get down! Take cover! This is going to be loud! The rumble could be heard approaching. A shockwave in the jungle could be seen racing outwards from the detonation site, knocking trees down flat as the wave raced outwards. The ground began to shake as well. The young warrior was both amazed and greatly confused. He could not even begin to guess what any of that was. All he knew was, yes, he would have that starburst after image in his eyes for weeks. And yes, the ground was seriously starting to shake and vibrate. As the sonic boom of the atmosphere hammered him down into the dirt, his whole world was earthquakes, hurricane winds, and deafening roars for longer than he could count. Some time afterwards, the young warrior felt the veteran's hand shake him. Get up, kid. It's over. And our ride is here. Let's get that shoulder treated. The young warrior stumbled, trying to see. They saw it. Their evac ship. It was the Archangel sitting on a rise, gleaming pristine white in the sun. Its side door was opening, 
and the human medics were hopping out to the shuttle the warriors aboard. This is the same ship that did. Yeah, kid. The Archangel is a human medevac transport. What do you think it was? The veteran said with a knowing grin. Honestly, I thought it was the destroyer of worlds. Not even close. But hey, when we get to the human forward base, remind me to point one of those out for you. End of story. And that, my friends, concludes this video.